This interview is part of a project of the Heritage Committee of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Columbus. In conversation with me, Nancy Gelson Braverman, will be one of our treasured and longtime members, Martha or Marty Worth. Marty, who many know best as our church's longtime program manager, 16 years, first came to Central Ohio when she was in the first grade. Her father had taken a job as a professor at The Ohio State University. Marty graduated from Upper Arlington High School, spent some time at the University of Michigan, and graduated from The Ohio State University with a degree in elementary education. She met her husband, Jerry Worth, also a longtime member and an exceptional volunteer at First Church, when he was a graduate student at Ohio State. They married and had their first child when they were both finishing their studies. With Jerry at work in the steel industry, they lived throughout the Midwest until Jerry retired. Because of their frequent moves, Marty never worked as a teacher, but kept busy raising their four children. At various churches throughout the Midwest, she taught Sunday school and worked as a volunteer. In their Pittsburgh church, she took a job on the church staff, which, as she said, began a 40-year career as a church lady. Upon retirement, the couple moved back to Columbus and came to First Congregational Church. In 2004, Marty became the church program, church's program manager, finally retiring from that job in 2020. Welcome, Marty, and let's start this conversation. So when when you were a child, did you and your family um, attend First Congregational Church? Yes, my, my mother joined here in 1946. So we immediately began attending Sunday school. And I remember vividly my Sunday school years here. Uh, my mother taught some of the time, but I, I always say that the beginning of my faith formation was there. Yeah. And I still say that those years are the, they, they are the most important years for my faith because that's where I learned it. Yeah, yeah. Who, who was minister at that time, senior minister? Boynton Merrill was minister, who incidentally, his family was from the same hometown in Massachusetts as my mother's family, and he was so happy to find somebody that he could talk about Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. So he was a wonderful, kind man, and but... The interesting thing about children at First Church at the time I was growing up, we were not allowed in worship. We're not allowed in the big church. Uh -huh. Sunday school, we had Sunday school in the rooms, the small rooms around here, and we had our own worship in this chapel, Gladden Cha what's now the Gladden Chapel. And we had our own hymnal, and we had our own worship service. So we had a worship service. The only time we were, quote, allowed in the big church was on Children's Day. Really? Not even like Christmas or Easter? We we had our own services. And, and I mean, I was in the children's choir. And we sang in the service sometimes, okay? But, I mean, as a as a common thing, we were not in the big church. Yeah. I don't even remember hardly ever being in the big church until I was confirmed. Do, do you know when that changed, when all of a sudden? No, well, I, I will say this. You have to understand. I grew up here. I was married, confirmed, married. We baptized our first child. And then in... in we left for 40 years. Right, right. So I have this big blank of <laughs> the church history, but I have, so I don't know. All as I know is when I, we were living in Florida, about to move back to Columbus, and I got the dispatch that had the article about the 150th. Oh, 
uh-huh. celebration of First Church. And I mean, it just brought back all these memories. So I wrote Tim Aarons a letter saying, you know, I grew up in the church and we're moving back and I'll probably come and visit. And I had no intention of joining because I didn't, if, if it was like what I was growing up, which I loved the Sunday school, but I hated the idea that they didn't like kids. Yeah, of course. I was not going to come back. And we had been Presbyterians for 35 years because it was very hard to find a UCC church in places that we lived. So, but I told Tim I would come back and I would probably come and visit. So I came one Sunday after we moved back and I told Jerry I'm going down to visit and see what it's like. Well, there were kids in worship and they had a children's sermon and everybody was so friendly and a person who me was a member of the church who used to babysit me recognized me and made a big deal about I was back and all this and Jan Wade took me up to, to show me the choir and all that. Oh, that's so great. Was that, do you think that was what, about early 2000s? It was 2000 and I think 2002. Right. And so you became the program manager in 2004. Yes, because I, I all, as I say, I always volunteered. And so when we moved back, I started volunteering in the music department, being music librarian. And I would come down Thursday afternoon, and in conversation with the then music minister, he found out all the experience I had on church staffs. He said, we have to get you working here. <laughs> good, good thought. <laughs> so that's how it all started. Yeah, yeah. What now? Other than I know you've been program manager, and that certainly was a huge, huge job. You've also done a lot of volunteering jobs at the church. Can you tell me some of those? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I taught Sunday school for years in different churches. I've always, because I've felt so strongly about the music problem program, I've been a volunteer music librarian, and I am here. And I, I've been in the choir. Mm -hmm. I was in the choir until 2015 here. Um, and that certainly is a volunteer job. And um, I've been on different committees. I'm a deacon now. Right, I see you doing your deacon work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's thanks to my husband, who was nominating chairman that year. And he said, I need another deacon. And so... <laughs> It's all in the family. Yeah, and I love it. I love yeah. being a deacon. Yeah. But, um, no, I've done, you know, I've been an office volunteer, help out in the office. So I... Well, as long as I've been at the church, I, I know I've seen you completely active in every single sense of the word. Well, my job as program manager, I mean, there was, that was not a position uh -huh. here. Yeah. They hired me to do the stuff that wasn't getting done. Yeah. So it took a while to figure that out. But can you can you um, go through the the various senior ministers that you you said? Um, Boynton Merrill was here so when I was when you young. Yeah. Okay, Boynton Merrill retired just before my wedding here. Oh, uh-huh. So he didn't And, very, and I very got <laughs> very, I was very upset with him, and I went and told him, it, you know, I was 19 years old. I said, Dr. Merrill, I am so sorry you can't marry me. He says, I have been married for 40 years, young lady. <laughs> anyway, you know. So we were married by an interim, Dr. Noyes, who was phenomenal, so kind, so wonderful. And then by the time Jeffrey, our first child, was born, Chalmers Co. was here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jeffrey was baptized, and we were here a short time, and then Jerry graduated, and we were off for 40 years. So Chalmers Co. was the last one I knew before we came back, With and Tim. Tim is here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I missed all those yeah. short-termers in between. Um. 
Tell me, well, so obviously your years at First Church were when you were very young, and then when you kind of, you and Jerry were kind of of retirement age. Right. What what impact has the church had on you, on those parts of your family life? Well, what was so interesting about coming back, you know, all the time I was working in churches or volunteering in churches, Jerry was not ever engaged in church. I mean, he came to church, we went to church as a family and everything, but he was never engaged. And part of that was because of his job. He was traveling and it wasn't easy to be engaged, but nobody ever asked him. Uh -huh. So we move here and within six months, he was on a committee. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. And as you know, he ended up having every, almost every lay position of leadership in this church, which made me so happy because he, he would say, I know so many people. And I said, but that's because you're involved. And so, and I used to kid, he, we would kid. He'd say, I'm so used to being Marty Worth's husband. I said, no, I'm Jerry Worth's wife. Yeah. But, and the fact that I, as I said, when I retired from here, I just feel like the journey I've made may, meant I was to work here. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, we move so much. And Jerry said each move we're off for a great adventure. And I'd say, oh, sure, you go to the job. I have to worry about selling the house and <laughs> everything. But I learned to look at it that way. And we belonged to UCC churches when we could. And then we belonged to Presbyterian churches. And But I never felt about them the way I felt about this place. Yeah, yeah. And and it's weird because children were like to be unseen. You know what I mean? I just but, find that so hard to believe about this church. I know, I know. And but yet the Sunday school was wonderful. They had a wonderful director of of Sunday school um uh when I was growing up. And and obviously that beginning made such a had such a powerful impact on me and also we move as we move we would join a church because that was a community we were comfortable in and we could meet people i mean because i learned from our first move that you know nobody's going to come to you you've got to put yourself out there yeah, yeah. and uh so from here to all the other churches that we belong to, I've always felt that I I belonged in a church community. This this church, I just always find it remarkable to realize that the church has been around for over 170 years. What do you think attribute? What's the what's the secret? Why does has it had such lasting power? Well, I think one thing about it is it's a beautiful building. I think the music has been a drawing factor. The fact that it's been, and I can't speak for the 40 years I wasn't here, but the fact that it has been upfront about it, it follows the social gospel and believes strongly in mission work. And it's, it's been out in the community. I mean, I, I don't know about other ministers, but of course Tim's been out in the community with bread and everything, but I don't, it, it's, people used to go to church. So I think one thing that happened was people just went to church on Sunday. That's what you did. I mean, this church is a downtown church, but it drew from everywhere. And I know when I look at the number, the names of the kids that were in Sunday school when I was here, I mean, they were from Grandview. They were, you know, from different 
part Upper Arlington, Bexley. There were a lot of a lot of families whose parents worked at the university. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a lot of those. They were either that or they were lawyers working downtown. Yeah. Yeah. But I think church was something you did, and I think I think that carried this place. I I'm just. Yeah. Yeah. postulating here or something, but I think church was a habit, and this church had a lot of people who were growing their, their kids were growing up in this church, and I think they came to church every Sunday because there was not out there soccer games and all the other stuff that now mm-hmm. people do not come to church because their kids got a soccer game. But I think that carried the church into probably, I'm trying to think when my kid, probably into the early 80s when all these other things kept pulling families away from the church. So I think, and and because in the 70s, Denny started the concert series, and that kept people coming to the church and being aware of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you've got you've hit on a lot of really great points about it. Um, let's talk a little bit um, more about the music here and why you think it's special or why you why it appeals to you. Well, I, I sang in the choir. This was the second church I sang in the choir. I didn't join a choir till my kids were grown. <clears throat> I love classical music. I love the the liturgy of music in the church. Mm-hmm. I love the anthems. I love singing the anthems. I love I love the formality of the eleven o'clock service. I love the the music, and we got these two fabulous pipe organs. Come on, Absolutely. and and. The the thing that I love about this church is the congregation respects and loves the music here. They they're so supportive of it. But I could sit and listen to anthems, you know, when I'm not in the choir and I hear an anthem that I've sung a thousand times, I'm sitting there singing the alto part in my head. <laughs> Because I just love, I love the music. I've always loved, I guess, the formality, for lack of a better word, of the 11 o'clock service. Because that's the service, kind of service I grew up with. Yeah. The, the music also, to me, seems to perfectly match the ambiance of the physical structure of the church. It does. I remember the first time I brought Jerry here to church. Mm-hmm. And he walked in and he said, this is a church. (laughs) I said, yes, and nobody talks. I mean, even when I was grown up and we started coming back and we were coming here after we were married and everything, I would not talk. I mean, you didn't talk in there, you know, And, and now, of course, it's totally different, you know. People talk until the 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 prelude starts. You know, you you know they have that sense. You're supposed to sit there and contemplate and all that. No, you're greeting your friends. That's what it's about. Yeah. yeah. So it's, but the music to me is. I have, I have been a member of churches where there were good and bad preachers. And if I couldn't worship through the sermon, I would worship through the music. Because if the music was done well, it represented the scripture and the whatever season of the year it was or whatever. And so... I think, you know, I think you're right on that. And I'm always um, impressed by how beautifully the 
gospel, the sermon, the hymns, the anthems, everything kind of works together. I know, and I spent 15 years in worship planning, and I learned a lot. Yeah. But it it was ama- it was amazing how it I learned how it all fit together. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> what what do you think our church um like you mentioned earlier, our church has had a pretty prominent position in the community. What do you think our place in this community is? I think at this point in time we need to be th- preaching the social gospel because somebody's got to do it. And, you know, I worked many years with the Good Samaritan Fund, and I love that ministry. The Good Samaritan Fund is, is the, or the fund that helps people who are in need with, ver- with money to pay things like bus tickets, rent. Well, uh, the Kroger cards for, for yeah. to pay utilities. Everything and that, and remind us that it's the first Monday of the month. Yeah, so, I don't know how they do it exactly now because it got, it got all messed up because of the pandemic when they couldn't do it at all. And yeah. they they do it now, but it's totally different than when I did it. But when I did it, I had volunteers who came in the second Monday of the month. They called on the first Monday to request help. And then they came on the second Monday of the month, and the volunteers were there. And, you know, we would process them all what their request was. And, it, it, you know, and we had the church members donated toiletries and things like that. And so they could get a bag full of those. And we got so efficient at processing people, not hurrying them, but figuring out the best way to do it. Um, in a couple of hours, we could get 60 people processed with appointments, finding out, you know, they bring their utility bills or they needed a Kroger card, they need a state ID, you know, those are the kinds of things we helped with. And um, because we had to figure a way to manage it, because when the financial crisis hit in 2009, we got overwhelmed. And this was only supposed to be a little part of my job, and it could have been a full-time job. Yeah. Wow. So we had to figure out how to manage it. So that's how we came up with that. You call on, uh, leave a message on the first Monday, of, or the first day of the month, and then the second Monday. And in between, we would call them back and say, mm-hmm. yes, you have a an appointment and whatever and yeah. find out what they needed. And that's how we managed it because it was over and and we also the word got out and we worked with agencies all over Columbus would call and say they needed help because they were so st- structured and red tape for want of a better word about what they could do. Whereas we were not. I didn't know that part of the Good Samaritan time. We were not. If you needed something, we would help you with it, within the parameters of what we helped with. But we did not. The only thing, paper we ever asked for was we did take their ID, but was if they needed help with the utility bill because we had to have the bill to be able to call the utility but we never had, they never had to justify their need. Yeah. I have the need. And so that's why I would have places like Ohio State Brain Injury Department call me and say, can we send so-and-so to you to get bus passes so he can get to his doctor's appointment. Yes. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Because they could not, within their rules and whatever, yeah, they, couldn't they, could not, they could not fill that need, whereas we, if I had bus passes and somebody needed them, sure, yeah. send them down, I'll give them. That is just a beautiful thing, and what an expression of... You know, Jesus is teaching to right. I mean, it serve was, the poor, and and we met the people, and the people, the people we they were ninety nine percent of them 
were hardworking people or really just trying to figure it out. Yeah. And I think because we met them with respect and we listened to them and all that, that's why the ministry was so wonderful. And that's why if you ever hear the word Miss Marty on the street, that's me. Because <laughs> the word gets out. I mean, the word got out and... You know, you have street rep, <laughs> <laughs> but they, you know, it was. I love doing it, yeah, and, and that, and that just you know, that um, kind of verifies what you were talking about how this church's place in the community is one of social justice. Well, and yeah. you know, I, I would get up and talk in church at, at the offering, and the congregation just. They love that ministry and they support it. I mean, it was the it was the biggest ministry of our missions all year mm -hmm. because they knew that the money, whatever they gave, was going out that month. And, and you guys were good stewards. We've been good stewards yes. of that money. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um. Is, in your times here at the church, are there are there any particular, oh, I don't know, religious or spiritual events that have had a, a big impression on you? I guess the thing that astonished me and everything was when we started Lessons and Carols. Mm -hmm. And that drew 600 people. And, and... Most of them were not members here. Right. So I guess lessons and carols would be the thing that I'm most impressed with because it, it was designed to be a community service, having community readers and all that. So I guess that would be... Yeah, I think that's a, a wonderful choice of something. And it's, you know, it was a gift to the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and as a as a community, um, this is a downtown church. So, what are your thoughts about what our challenges are as a downtown church? Our challenges of a downtown church is how do you get people from because it's five counties around. We have members. How do you get programming for say a Wednesday night program? Like when I was a Presbyterian in a neighborhood church, there'd be Wednesday night where the kids would have choir and then there'd be a church dinner and maybe a Bible study and all that. And that's extremely difficult to do. And because we have to do almost everything on Sunday here. I mean, Josh is working to get the choristers going and um and you can do it but it's hard it's hard work to get people to come downtown after work or you know their kids have soccer and plays and homework and everything so that it's a challenge it's a challenge and I think they did a pretty good job with like establishing the playground and we had different events for the kids on Sunday, but it's hard. I don't really, I've seen the struggle. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to keep trying and one one of the things that I think too is that the beauty of our physical structure and the fact that we're pretty prominently placed in the downtown area. We're right on Broad Street next to the art museum, so that gives us a little bit of um, extra. Well, and the other thing is, this church is fifty um, fifteen minutes from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, there are people that are way up on uh, on the other side at 270 that are members here, but they're the ones that come regularly, you know what I mean? But 
when 670 went through, I mean, I heard people say in the choir when I came back and was in the choir here, 670 made a huge difference in coming from Reynoldsburg and everything down the church. I can get down the church in 15 minutes now, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so I think our highway system has helped. And from the time I started working here, we tried to get the word out around because we've got a lot of businesses and everything around, and we just couldn't crack it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was because they would say, we don't want a lot of solicitation. And I said, well, we're not soliciting. We just want to say we're here and we're, this is what's going on. So I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. Although our... our um Membership and attendance doesn't seem that it's suffered so greatly. I mean, it, we seem to be in pretty good shape. It's, it, yes. I think once people come and get involved and they get stay. their kids involved, then then they, they love to come here and they love to have their children brought up here. And the pandemic just decimated Sunday school. It's a shame. As it does, as it did so many programs everywhere. It, it did. And I mean, I think the attendance at church service has really picked up. Um, you know, it's kind of recovered from, from the pandemic, but it's been hard to get the kids yeah. back. Well, um, we've talked about a lot of things. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to say about your experience at First Church? My experience at First Church is I love the congregation, and everybody in it is a friend. And I just feel the, such a sense of community here. You know, I it's, agree, yeah. I was so happy to come back in <laughs> person worship because I miss seeing my friends. And I mean, by friends, I mean everybody. I mean, I, I check every Sunday, even though I sit in the front pew now and can't see who's here, but I get to take the offering. I check and see who's missing. Uh-huh. Good for you. You know? So I... I just feel that, I mean, this church has the best sense of community and caring for each other of any church that I've experienced. And I, you know, I've had a broad experience with a lot of places. I'm, I am just completely bowled over by the diversity and the sense of intelligence and excellence, oh. and talent that is in this congregation. And, and, you know, I am too. It's just... It's just amazing. The people are so so smart and so they are working so hard on their faith journey. I get that feeling. The people are here are really invested in their faith journey and so many of them want to contribute to the church in whatever way they can and and the diversity, I mean, obviously. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So if you could offer a prayer for First Congregational Church for the future, what would your prayer be for this church? Okay, I'm going to tell you this. All the years I was on staff at churches, I said, never ask me to do a prayer. I'm happy reading someone else's prayer. <laughs> but I, here's what I will say. That what I hope for the future of this church is that it continues with a sense of community, with a sense of caring about each other. And because we care about each other, we can care for people outside. And we must continue our mission work in the community because if we don't do it i don't know who else is doing it it's and i know a lot of churches do it but it's the mission work in this church is special absolutely so i guess that's my prayer but i i'm not good at I, th I think that's a fabulous prayer, and I think you said it just just right. Well, you know, I, I 
that was the bane of my existence when I was on church staff. <laughs> Don't ask me to pray. <laughs> I mean, I'll be glad to say the Lord's Prayer, but I can't make up a prayer. <laughs> and I've even been in study groups where you've studied how to pray, and I don't get it. Uh, somehow I think you could do it. You could do it if you had to. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I That's what I hope. I mean, I, this is a healthy church. It is. And it's a healthy downtown church, which is, which ama is, <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. That in itself is a miracle and amazing and a testament to this place. Absolutely. Marty Worth, thank you. Thank you for your time today. You have been so much fun to talk to, and you are such a valuable member of our congregation. Well, thank you.